Oh, I can one of those. Was it was it 100%? Is there a test? Yeah, it was 90% of the students because of 15 questions, and 90% would be uh, 13 to 5, which is technically not possible. <laughs> So they might just say 80% or 100%. What question do you Stupid questions. Oh, okay. I had to do one of the sort of Durham, but some of the training was like so outdated, it was ridiculous. No, this is the dangers of internet forums and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this, this wasn't, this wasn't quite like that. Yeah. They were just. I guess making people aware of sort of general stupidity of using data and that you should have been half of online phone and encrypted as well. The problem with encrypted hard drives is you can't use modes of music software. Yeah. So I know I have a laptop that I can't actually use for my job while I have a laptop, but I can't take it off. I'm, yeah. yeah. So they make these all these fancy videos, um, but the information there is actually coming out to bed. And luckily they had a transcript button, so I was just spending two minutes reading the transcript rather than spending two minutes and watching a video with fancy actors and people <laughs> in suits and stuff. Um. I did all my mandatory training last week on data protection, Quality, um, I can't a few more. Uh, oh, that, was, that was not an online training video, but I did, okay. did have some unconscious bias training. Mm. Actually, I found that one really interesting. Do you want to waste some strength here, actually? Uh, no, if yeah, you want to start, that, I think uh, well, actually, I, 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 you're introduced to oh. the uh, your, your uh, lecturing. Do you, do you, do you want, want to uh, uh, introduce sort of electric pixels a little oh, bit oh, in yeah. the background? I think yeah. that was, uh, oh, great. Yeah, I can do that. Mm -hmm. It's like a separation of concepts and stuff like that. Like a research team. Who's in the department? Just with Nick Collins. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is, uh, is Trevor Wishart still associated? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, we had this conversation. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's okay, it's okay. And, <laughs> uh, no, he's been around for uh, maybe three, four years, I think. He's getting on a bit, isn't he? Rodri spoke really highly of the technician at Durham, who I don't think I've ever met. He said that he built his own synths in the basement. Um, oh, that's the old technician, uh, I think. Yeah, the current technician. <laughs> yeah. We had that good We had some pretty terrible interactions. And yeah, one of which was like about how difficult it would be for him to set up an eight channel. Oh really? That's, that's beyond the pale. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think he just his background is more from like teching for bands and stuff. So I think like just more complex stuff. This doesn't really this not very well. Yeah, I 
I think I forgot. Stream, so hello if there is audience there. Too. Uh, it's recorded, so we, oh well, we say we've been archived. Anyway, um, so a few things about Electropic 7 and about the subject a bit. Uh, so, Electropic is the ninth edition of Electropixel. So, it's been nine years we're doing, we're organizing this festival. So, it was mainly in Nantes and we organized it. And, um, Last year we started to think about um, making it international and touring the festival because we got fed up with the, um, the local uh, institution not really organising this kind of festival and uh, not supporting us and I uh, found that um, a bit uh, pity considering we were like raising um, an old scene and an old uh, contribution from international artists and, and so we decided that we will um, go and um, transport this festival um, in different cities. Also because 10 years ago, this festival was part of a big network uh, called Pixelac Network. And actually what happened to us in Nantes happened to all those places in all over Europe and, and in other continents that we're connected to. Because this network was very strong 10 years ago and then in 10 years, all the festival dropped down and disappeared for similar reasons as us. Mm -hmm. Not enough support for local, uh, by local uh, institution. And so therefore wondering why they continue to raise such a festival and support an international community. But still after 10 years and after all this festival disappeared and all these communities, the question is still uh, remaining how we continue to reinforce those networks where the artists uh, could diffuse and could show their work uh, all over Europe or all over the world uh, when they are in a bit of a crossing this interdisciplinary practices between digital sounds and a new form of uh, uh, music or uh, anything that is a bit like different or networks um, or live coding or anything else like that. So um, where they, could they show their work? And so we, we're still battling, 10 years after, to keep this festival. And we, we and Pixel in Bergen are the only uh, remaining festival. I think Pixel Arc is doing something 
uh, there in Finland that is really like locals and very uh, anti-many. So Pixel in, uh, in Bergen, they continue to do that. And they also tour more in South America. But, um, and we decided to try out this form of festival where we uh, cross Europe. And instead of uh, waiting for people to try to build their own, trying to meet them and say what's going on and uh, push for uh, things to happen and tour uh, artists with us or uh, cross people. Um, it's of course a very um, DIY and it's not fully supported to be able to do it fully. But the energy there, I think people want to be to to diffuse, to meet. And so I think, yeah, there's still that happening and we need to be there. Anyway, so that's also why this seminar here in Goldsmiths is uh, symbolical because it's, Goldsmiths is also a place where things are being experiments and a lot of uh, our peers have been doing their PhDs here or their research. <coughs> and so I think it's important to, to be here. And, um, <laughs> so later on, later on we will have the fully map program. It's in the van coming from Norwich, where we were previously. Uh, as you expect, we didn't bring any with us. But they're coming this afternoon. Anyway, uh, this whole year, also, APU 33 decided to work on this question of bodies, embodiment. So we had a previous seminar, in, a previous conference seminar in Nantes uh, on this subject. And then the whole year, 2019, we, we wanted to explore this, this notion. Uh, and then, um, that's why uh, we, we proposed this, this title uh, that seems for few of you maybe the abstract electronic bodies and the abstract morphology of the real. Um, so, okay. <laughs> and there you go, should have a problem. So, I'm not, we're going to share the introduction to, to the people together with Iris. I just wanted to say that um, this seminar is the continuations of the other seminar we've done in Nantes, thinking about how, uh, how we approach the body in our new uh, um, musical and art practices, how we, uh, we use the technology, how we not use the technology, how we go and get, how we're working with, uh, but also how the new perception, the new understanding through this technology or not, or against this technology, okay. we transform or we have another view of what's surrounding us. So I think it's not as difficult as it sounds, but how things change today and how our perspectives change uh, the last decades <coughs> using technology and how uh, the, the relation between our body and the, and the, uh, the cities, the architecture, uh, and what's happening uh, to us and then all the different things that um, we cross with that. So it's the seminar is in, in a way trying to put these questions with different perspectives from the different people that are going to talk, of course. Uh, I'll have a, maybe a, a quicker, a longer introduction after we maybe introduce the program. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Do you want to introduce with me? So, because we co-curate with um, Iris, um, the people uh, that will uh, talk today. So, so, myself, maybe quickly, and then I, or you. Yeah, yeah, no, just, just well, I'm uh, Gino Tavi, I'm Dr. Enoch. Uh, and uh, <coughs> I've been uh, doing sounds and uh, digital arts and media practices uh, for the last 20 years, exploring uh, the boundaries of this form of art and trying to think about it and uh, reflections on what I'm doing, why at the same time is trying to push for new networks and voice, noise explorations from uh, playing the um, the, well, we could call it classical uh, now because uh, if you take David Tudor or John Cage, it should be classical. But uh, and then to um, exploring new uh, new ways like online orchestras or or different other type of connections. 
My name is Iris Garelfs. I'm a lecturer in Sonic Art here at Goldsmiths and I run the uh, Masters in Sonic Art. So, anyone of you interested, uh, come and talk to me. Um, I also run with Koja uh, with uh, John, the SBR research unit. And uh, so, this is part of uh, what we're doing today. Um, my own practice goes back quite a long time. <laughs> uh, I'm I guess I'm sort of grounded in voice and using voice in my practice. And since the beginning of the 2000s, I've used um, Max and digital means to um, expand sort of my palette in terms of expressing myself and in terms of the complexity that I'm able to create sounds with and improvisation. And I guess there's sort of a few musings that I will be um, doing later in the talk around those topics and how they will connect for me or also disconnect uh, for me. Um, yeah. And using voice of the body really is quite an important um, part of how I work. Um, so the topic is really very interesting to me and also very timely, I think. So more and more people are becoming sort of interested in sort of physicalities again within sort of digital or alongside the digital world across the digital, so mm -hmm. thank you for being my day. Your conference would be called Bodily Interaction and Vocal Performance. Yes. Do you want me to start with the talk or do you want, did you want to Maybe I'll continue it? quickly. Yeah. Uh, uh, we could introduce the different uh, people. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so because I um, also <coughs> invited um, Chili Lots, is here. I'm trying to find because it's not the paper, it's just find the, the, the name of your talk and um, so um, I lost it often. anyway uh, Shelley uh, you're a doctor in music and you're doing your research postdoc in Newcastle yeah. on uh, uh, the project is about um, uh, AI tools so we've been uh, we've been working usually for a few years now, um, and we have, we sort of like gather around this idea of a network uh, orchestra and a network performance and music real time uh, coding um, and sort of like exchanging sounds and performing online. So it's been something we approach with a different orchestra. She's part. She created uh, a, an orchestra called Awful. Um, Orchestra for female lap and laptop. Yes, because okay. I used to awful. Sorry. Uh, and then we exchange with Gazo, which is another acronym. Sorry, just stand for Great uh, Internet Audio Streaming Orchestra. And um, so we've been exchanging through this practice about um, how we're making t music today in, a, in sort of a extra planetary uh, exchange. Um, and uh, so you, the name of your conference will be Feminist Algorithmic Music Practices. Yeah. <laughs> That's about right. Um, <laughs> then uh, after that we, we're going to have an artist called Swad Mani from Tunisia. We cannot bring her, it was difficult to bring her um, to the seminar. She would come to Paris in the in the uh, it's closer and it's easier for her. But um, I still wanted to uh, invite her. She probably look at us. Hi. Uh, she will stream from uh, Tunisia, and she will uh, do a, a first conference in English. So nice to be understanding. She want me to say that. Um, we'll have questions with her about if you need. So. Uh, our title is Impression Problem on the Run, How to Become One with the World. So she's an artist that works with memory and time, uh, but also with um, real-time data produced by uh, temperatures and climate change in general from the cities, and how we receive this data, we visualize it, and how it does have an impact on our understanding of the world. She's also a video artist, and we, we've just shown in uh, knowledge, a piece with sound and data visualization where we start to think about how we um, transform this data into sound and uh, there you go. Uh, after we have the pose, 
one, uh, around one pin. Then Jenny Piquet is a long time collaborator of mine. We both work since 10 years together. Uh, she, she's also, um, she's been in Goldsmiths. She's doing a master in interactive media here, 2008, eight, seven. <laughs> and uh, she's also working with uh, intermedia, video sounds, and uh, she's also composing music. And we will be talking about haunting memories, radio static, spectrum research, and body antenna, basically around radio arts and uh, radio uh, phenomena. So the body and the disappearing, the uh, sort of things happening with the radio and uh, the body and the technology. Then we we well, meant to have just as long, but she couldn't make it finally. So we'll have Chloe Malez, which is one of my ex students from the Art of Not, and she's now a, 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 a master in arts. And she will be presenting uh, her work and her research that she's been doing uh, the, last, the last few years about the electronics and the machines, the uh, obsolescence of the machine and the DIY sort of practices, uh, circuit bending. Uh, <coughs> then we will have uh, Bernard Living, that will come this afternoon. And he is a composer here in Southampton. And we've been, uh, we met him last year in the Electropic Cell in London, we've done an eclectic. And then um, it was, he's, an, he's organizing this uh, regular um, concessory called, called Corps, it, Corps, What's I forgot now. Yeah, just yeah. Corpus Ali. Um, Alina, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, he's going to talk about the living in the present continuous. He's got, he's a, he's a sound art composer, musician, working with a lot of minimal sounds and a sort of uh, this listening micro sound type of, uh, of, uh, of composition. So he will explain why we talk about. Uh, a specific artist and uh, he's got his own way of doing these ideas. Then we have um, Adam. Adam Parkinson, sitting up there, thank you for coming. Uh, Adam used to uh, be in the computing department, so he's a PhD um, here at Goldsmiths, and is now a senior lecturer um, at London South Bank. London South Bank University. Um, what is your title? Of your talk? Um, I think you said it. I'm not um, completely sure. Um, I can't remember what I said it. I, I'm just going to try and talk about a few of the practices I've been involved yeah. in, how I can make the lakes of these my interpretations of the themes of those. Adam is an amazing artist, and I really like that he's going to perform later on as well. So I really looking forward to that. Yeah, because we have a pose <coughs> at 5, around 5. And then 6.30, we have um, the different um, people when, um, having performance of Bernard, leaving Adam Parks and James Mellon that you invited. Um, yeah, James Mellon is one of uh, my students. And he's working um, <coughs> with a laptop and feedback. But it's quite interesting, it's usually not plugged in, so he's using the uh, laptop in a very sort of instrumental and direct and physical way, sort of moving it about. <coughs> and um, yeah, so I felt that was quite fitting with the theme because it's sort of a slightly different take on on the, the interaction element of it. Um, yes, so I guess the late the what the performance entails will all be revealed later. We also um, bring a uh, electronic music uh, ensemble we're working on in France. Called Dean, and so we will present a performance uh, shortly with a lot of modular synths and all the new form of instruments and how we work as a collective. Then you will also perform. Uh. Yes, I'm um, going back to basics, um, just want to have a little amp that I'm going to be moving about with. So we'll be thinking a little bit about more about interaction in space and trying to make that more uh, ambulatory, I suppose. And chilly, I uh, would. End of the night, actually, not. with some live things. Good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. yeah. uh, and I guess they're all quite sort of short set and sort of uh, yeah. reaching into each other as well. Yeah. yeah. 
Hey guys, that's the introduction. I was planning for a longer introduction, but I think I'm gonna skip that and then uh, just introduce. I think uh, it's you, Iris, over the top. Mm, no, you okay? I'm just see. Yeah, the the pin lower so. So. about the sounds that I'm making, the way I'm thinking about the interactions that happen. Um, so, I've been working with Adam in a research project recently, and uh, he was talking about the ecology of things, and that's really made me sort of think about the ecology of interactions that we have in, in performance for me, which is um, sort of between the sound itself, the body of the sound, the body of the performer, sort of the bodies of the audience, and the spatial body in which things take place, and also sort of the instrumental sort of body as an ac active thing that I'm engaging with. So, um, these, I think, sort of held together for me in performance primarily through listening. So, this connection that establishes itself between the sort of different elements is for me through my ears and through my body as I listen in the performance and the activity. Uh, and the sound that then sort of emerges from that is also being reabsorbed in listening. So that's quite um, quite an active sort of activity that takes place in addition to um, the sounds that I'm making. So I get confused with the things. Um, so in one respect, that's quite a mental activity as well, that listening that takes place, and the concentration that takes place uh, with that. But then again, um, sort of the body and the mind, or as they are traditionally called, are not sort of separate entities. They are also an ecology of the body and an ecology of being. Um, that, to kind of read this quote, um, what we call mind and what we call body are not two things, but rather aspects of one organic process. So that all our meaning, thought and language emerge from the aesthetic dimensions of this embodied activity. What for me sort of has crystallised over time is the importance of meaning that is established in this listening process that I'm engaging in, but also that the audience engages in and the connection with the body, and I will talk a little about that a little bit later. Um, to start off with, in the relation with technology that has come out for me, um, it's quite nicely condensed in this uh, quote by Cathy Barbarian. Do you all know Cathy Barbarian? Um, <coughs> 
She is quite an amazing, one of the sort of pioneers in voice uh, work using exp uh, expanded vocal techniques and also working with, um, with tape. Um, what she stated is, or what she said, I must state here that the techniques of recording and montage have had a fundamental role in vocal music. So that in a way reflects on how I'm working as well in collecting materials that I make through voice and collaging and montaging together and the way that reflects on how the sort of meaning is collaged together but also the expressions and the different bodies that emerge are collaged together. Um, the fact, she continues, that it is impossible uh, that it is possible to record a sound or sounds with a tape recorder isolate them from their original context. So all of you will probably have known of reduced listening, music contracts, so I won't go into that. Um, isolate them from their original context, so in effect from the original body also. Listen to them per se as a sound, then modify and combine them with other sonic elements belonging to other contexts. Um, and that has allowed the musician and the singer to listen in ways different from reality or reality in terms of the sources that a sound belongs to or the bodies that a sound belongs to. Um, and from all the sounds that normally escape our attention because they are absorbed and masked by the action which produces them and the experience which provokes them. So that in this moment of isolating the sound or the vocal sound from my body and recombining them, there is a little space that opens in which something can be listened to differently and drawn attention to differently. And it's been quite interesting that over the years when I've been um, working um, sort of in live performances and people see me making a sound, mouth opens, goes blah blah blah, but they can actually hear the sound being produced by the speakers because I might have just shafted into a buffer to be working with later. And vice versa, something then might come out of the speakers, you know, the disconnected body, that then isn't associated with my body in the space so as I've been making it. And as I've been quite interested in that sort of fragment, fragmentation and dissociation for a while. I sort of come more around to um, trying to bring that back closer together in sort of recent practices and recent work. Um, is that in working with technology I've come to think about there being sort of an overlapping spectrum of different ways of making vocal sounds or working with vocal sounds. Sort of on the one hand side you've got your spoken words, your textual meaning, then it goes on to singing or extended vocal techniques and I'll just put that into one bracket because what is one culture's singing is another one's vocal. Uh, extended vocal techniques, so it's a little bit culture dependent. But then also the augmented voice when you start bringing in electronic means or digital means by which to extend this palette. So we're essentially now into a realm of vocal sounds and the disassociate sound of the vocal textures that Kathy Barbarian were talking about earlier. Um, <coughs> <coughs> the sort of second sphere of, sort of overlapping spectrum that comes from it is that you have on the one hand side the sound you know, as an abstract body entity, entity itself, then the body of me, sort of performing person, and uh, the meaning that is sort of created out of that. So that's a little bit of zooming into this ecology of sound. Uh, of bodies that I was talking about earlier, um, talking, thinking more about the sound 
that is being produced and how it's that also then received by a person uh, listening to it. Um, so interesting again for me talking about um, voice as body or bodies and voices is this uh, quote by Meredith Monk. Everyone knows Meredith Monk? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> marvellous. Um, so she really talked about voice as the body or as flexible as the body, where um, the voice becomes an instrument in itself. So it's not just a singing voice that uh, translates a text or a meaning or a nice melody. It's really a much more complex instrument. And she said, I had this flesh, a complete revelation that the voice could be as flexible as the body. And that's quite interesting for me, kind of making that connection of being the voice as flexible as the body, but also then sort of being separate from the body. You know, whereas it is really an integ integral part, and the way my body is on any given state will have a bearing on how the voice sounds. So if I have <coughs> a cold, it will be a little bit harsher. Um, it changes uh, with age, it changes with emotional states. So all this really goes very much hand in hand. So again, so this nice idea of there being sort of different bodies, but one body, and they're sort of moving around each other and moving into each other and being processed that have an effect on each other, produce an effect also. Um, so, this is sort of the singing extended realm, but then taking it further into a means of augmenting it, say with digital means, electronic means, and adding different qualities of sounds that can be added to the voice. It's not just becoming uh, an instrument, it's becoming a full-blown orchestra, you know, which I can put <coughs> my voice in, but affect it to, <coughs> um, to create totally different sounds as I go along or think about structures from the voice or that are emerging from the voice and that I can then play with uh, in improvisation. Um, I quite like, I mean, there's Nam Jim Kai said this in 65, so that's donkey's years ago. The voice's instrument, um, sorry, someday artists will work with capacitors, resistors and semiconductors as they work today with brushes violins and junk. So this idea that technology becomes art material and not just technological material and that in me using the voice and technology a sonic picture is being painted and the different palettes are there for me to use. Mm. We were talking about Trevor Wishart earlier, and lo and behold, there he is. Um, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Trevor Wishart's been really at the sort of pioneering end, I was about to say, forefront of uh, extended vocal techniques, but also augmented vocal techniques. And he really talks about um, morphing sounds and uh, creating the sounds out of each other, translating them, morphing them. And it's quite interesting in... So if, I use, if, I'm, if I'm using my voice, I'm already able to do that to some extent. You know, I can go from... Go quite quiet, go quite loud. So there is a certain quite direct morphology that's possible with the voice directly. But when you are then taking other means to work with that, that is so much more that's possible. Um, 
Trevor Wishart here said um, about his composition Vox 5, which he created in 86. And um, if you're interested, he um, has a really interesting paper from Jay Storr about it, where he talks about the work. Um, <clears throat> anyway, he said, the primary oral focus of Vox 5 is a superhuman voice that metaphorizes into many recognizable sonic images, such as the sound of cows, bees, or horns, or bells. This voice also employs various extended vocal techniques, these further extended by spectral manipulation of the material by the computer. So again, this sort of um, extended vocal techniques and further extended or augmented, as I call it. Um, so interesting here is that Chema talks about very recognisable sources so earlier, Cathy Bavarian um, talked about it in terms of abstracted sounds and take them to a different uh, realm. Here, it's talked about in terms of they're becoming recognisable in a to totally different way so that people have their associations with it. So if I make um, sounds, um, something like that. <laughs> You know, people have often said, oh, that sounds a bit like a monkey. Or when it then becomes um, digitally transformed and it goes a little bit more into this sort of register, people associate that insects. Um, so quite interesting how the mind kind of seems to want to make sense and meaning out of the sounds that are being created and moving away from an abstracted... Um, appreciation into something that's again quite concrete. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about this sort of meaning side of things, because that's really quite interesting. Um, so when I when I have used the voice, I use real audio. So there isn't usually samples that go in, or captured, or synthesized materials. It's my voice, real audio, um, or anything that you can stick into a microphone, I suppose. So on the one hand, you have sort of legible sounds, and on the other hand, you have got abstracted sounds. And I guess there is that sort of spectrum, again, between things. But what's sitting there sort of in the middle is really meaning, or trying to distill meaning or extract meaning from one end of um, the sounds. But we also bring meaning with, it, with us into this whole process. So our ideas, um, biases, experiences, daily forms will all go into this process of creating meaning from something that we've heard. Um, and just to illustrate this, I wanted to read you this quote by um, the Italian musicologist Rodolfo Caletti. And it's not the whole. What it says, I was talking about uh, Maria Callas. Uh, do you all know about Maria Callas? Very sort of famous opera singer. So he said, the timbre of Callas' voice, considered purely as sound, so uh, the boldness and the question marks uh, regarding purely, was essentially ugly. So that is a total meaning that's being assigned to a voice. And um, transmitted as something that is um, an objective sort of criticism or an objective thing, her voice is ugly. You know, there's no bones about her, it's just what it is. No, it's kind of what you regarded. But continuing further, it was a thin sound which gave the impression of dryness, of aridity. It lacks those elements which, in singer's jar jargon, are described as velvet and varnish. In compensation, her timbre was incisive. I would say this metallic edge in her voice took the place of the varnish. Furthermore, her voice was penetrating. 
In certain areas, her range uh, of her range of voice also possessed a guttural quality. And so it goes on with being quite judgmental about her voice. And anyone who is sort of roughly familiar with the discussion on the female voice um, in recent time will totally see how that comes out in his judgment of her singing voice. You know, that a woman is supposed to have a soft, velvety quality, and anything that's sort of harsh is just not considered female. Which also transfers back to when I'm making um, strange sounds with a voice. You know, people are often a little bit bemused by that, or uh, if they're not used to that. So, yeah, how shall we say this? Um, quite awkward, I find that quite awkward. Um, Um, Joan La Barbara has also experienced this, unsurprisingly, because she is sort of one of the volunteers, uh, volunteers sorry, uh, pioneers of this way of working. And in this quote, he says this, um, relating it to madness. You know, these kinds of sounds being experienced by people as expressions of madness. Um, you would get these pieces that were written by various pieces, uh, like Eight Songs for a Mad King or something that uh, was always this kind of crazy thing, and that's why you use the EVT's um, extended vocal techniques. I see them more as a kind of orchestra that I use, my palette of sounds. So I don't see them as crazy the sounds, even though when I first started to do my solo contact concerts, I would sometimes get people in the audience who would start giggling because I used sounds that they either were uncomfortable with in the music situation, or, were, or they were so unusual that it was the kind of nervousness that an audience exhibits when they haven't heard that kind of thing. And if they're immature, they love. <coughs> so it's quite interesting that, so again, there is sort of another meaning that sort of sneaks in in there, which is <coughs> on the one hand side, yes, that's how um, the voice is being perceived. But sort of laughing <clears throat> as a response is something immature, and that's not necessarily how I see it, because I, I find some things are just funny. <coughs> and I don't feel it has to be necessarily serious music. It can be humorous at the same time. So again, sort of an extra, and sort of a different spectrum of how things are appreciated or the context that they take place in or how people want to want to regard these um, sounds. Um, so I don't know if I've noticed that saying that So I've I've tried to play with these different aspects over the years in different ways. Um, <clears throat> so on the left hand side is sort of the more traditional sort of setup with voice and the laptop and uh, various gadgets to sort of manipulate uh, them in Max MSP. Uh, so primarily that is me, my voice that I make the instrument of the laptop and the voice and that interaction going on and how I uh, work with one to affect the other. And that I've over the years found to be quite limiting because it's only sort of using my, a partial aspect of my body. And that I haven't really found a way with that I'm sort of totally happy with. So I've gone back to sort of more, um, minimal ways of using electronics. So on the, on also interacting not just with the sound but also with audiences and spaces and moving this sort of <coughs> ecology that put a picture back in there around a little bit more and make that more amorphous and flexible. So on the right hand side is a photo of me with a little mixer and I sometimes attach that to sort of different body parts and move around the audience and then let people listen to it by moving my body around in different ways. So that is, is the, 
different ways of how a sound can emanate from the body as well. So traditionally you've got um, voice up here, speakers there or surround. So with this I was trying to just to change that a little bit and put my mouth sort of on a limb as it were and move that around. Um, with a picture at the bottom that also uses the speakers and a little head mic. But it also gives audiences a kind of ear trumpet um, by which they can move around and change the, the experience of the performance themselves. And I will then also go around and interact with different people in the audience differently. Um, so that there, it's not just an interaction between sort of the um, emanating sound and the making of sounds, but also that interaction between performer and audience and audience and sound sort of changes. So with the ear trumpet you sort of move around and um, the sound changes in your ears as you go along. Um, yes. I guess I guess I hope it sort of made sense what I was talking about. It's not so much a sort of linear progression of arguments to lead to some conclusion. It's sort of more of a musing of themes that I've been mulling over and that for me haven't quite sort of settled on anything proper yet, but that I'm quite interested in looking at further and sort of discussing further with people and sort of seeing different takes that people have on sort of similar problems, I suppose, or similar concerns. I think James, for example, will be the scene later, is also sort of taking this idea of interaction and, <coughs> and um, interactability between instrument and person and body, but explores that in a totally sort of different way. And I guess that's what I really like it, about seeing these sort of concerns as an, as an ecology or as a spectrum of things, because we can also find our individual and interesting ways of playing with them and quite a rich sort of listening and performance culture, I suppose. So, um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. And um, thank you. If there is any questions, maybe. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just not on the door again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very dark. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Probably have a few, but. Um, did, so, this, this, you work and your research with the extended vocal techniques and mm. the uh, augmented voices. And then <coughs> you bring something in your uh, talk about the uh, female voice criticism. So, and I was wondering, so because you s we have the experience of um, a very uh, sort of um, strong woman practicing voice from uh, Mary Did Monk to yeah. Joanna Barbara, that were like also in contemporary music yeah. and dance and had those big moments, I think, in history still. Uh, and I was wondering how you see that today, except from the reaction of people, but how you see this, how this criticism is repeating and how, how you, how, what's your ideas about getting out of it or what's the, the sort of like, um, how, how things change for you compared to this woman's uh, the female voice. What, how do you approach this, this, the criticism they faced at that time today yeah. I don't know if it, I don't know if it's clear, but how you um, do you have, did you build strategy to or answer to that, or will you just let it flow? And uh, I was wondering how it goes. To yeah, I, I guess there is sort of two two sides to it. One that is the artistic side, and the other one is sort of the political angle mm -hmm. on it as well. And and uh, I guess over the years, people have become more aware of it, or certainly people in the arts contexts have become more varied. I mean, there was a time when that wasn't the case. And even male colleagues would be sort of, or at least in the UK, would be sort of quite, what are they doing? It's just 
far too ooh, you know, because this idea of you know wanting to be cool and mm. yeah and that I think has has melted away to some extent so people that used to make these comments now are much more appreciative about the voice as an instrument and not having to sort of blush or shrink away and if I go, if I go ah. Um, but on the, on the political side, I think you can use that by going around and interacting with people and just being just normal about it. So, you know, I don't think there's anything weird with that, if you do. So I think that's quite a strong way of working with that as well, my strong work, way of working with that. And, um, and to answer the last part of your question, I think where sort of in previous years I would have, or I would have been really annoyed about that. Uh, I think now I just sort of accept it as just people are people and I'll do what I do. If they don't like it, they can leave. Mm. And on the political side of it, um, as a form of a restating of what we call the novlung, I don't know how it's the words in English though, but um, the more and more politicians are using, um, you know, this type of a language that doesn't have any meaning. And I think I got the feeling that people like use voice today have also somehow not responsibilities maybe too much, but they are we are like taken by this new way of doing politics or talking to people, which we could use words without meaning. And then sometimes sound poetry, mm. you know, it has the idea to get to the sound and create new meanings. But in politics there's like no meanings. So I was wondering um how do you feel that in, in when you inter intervene in public sphere? Mm. Do you do you have this feeling that people are well, they, they will be shocked, of course, but do you have, do you have, it does have an impact on? It's a bit more maybe complex connection here I'm making, but uh, I it's because I'm thinking about it. But yeah. That's, are you I'm not sure about mm. impact? Mm. Truthfully, mm. Um, so you were asking us something earlier, and I had an answer to that, which I've forgotten now promptly. What were you asking earlier? Um, oh yes, the 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 um, voice poetry poetry thing. <clears throat> so the way I started with that was quite honestly because I can't remember lyrics. Um, so I thought, well, I just do ooh la la. <laughs> that sort of gets me. Um, so so that there was a. And, the, and, and, and a sense that there are so many sounds that this voice can produce and in using lyrics and songs and a style you are always sort of quite confined to, to a um, specific segment of it. So this is sort of how, how I've sort of come to it really and, and uh, the other aspects of it sort of have come to it over the years or become sort of visible or audible for me over the years. Um, There was something else I've forgotten again. Sorry. Any other questions? Yes. Is there something unique about the voice <coughs> as an instrument that I couldn't say the violin is, is it's, as the sound maker is completely embodied, so you might play the violin and play it like you hear mm. But as you're singing, you've got this weird mix of this resonating with the inner ear and outer ears is free. But you can't hear how it works in the concert. Who is that? How do you deal with that? Can you, or is that not an issue? Is that well, it's, 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 it's partially an issue, but also partially not, because I usually work with some kind of mediated technology, mm -hmm. so that's some kind of feedback from it that comes to me uh, from, from the outside. And that if I was making sort of complex things, I would certainly need. Uh, if I was doing a more sort of linear uh, thing, then probably not. Um, I never like listening to my voice when it's recorded. Mm -hmm. It's a funny mm -hmm. thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so that's definitely yeah. that, that uh, different experience in your body when you're using your voice and 
a different resonation in the synapse. Any other questions? Um, how do you think about the work that you do in non-life situations? Does it can it really exist if it's not life? Or how do you think about Ooh, it? Can, can it exist on the internet? Can it exist oh, in totally. Yeah. I mean, I've um, as with I mean, Trevor Wishar talks about that quite a bit in terms of in terms of collecting materials that you make in improvisation and recording and then collaging it into a into a composition. And that I guess that's also something that I, I work with when I create uh, compositions from voice. So I do uh, record myself interacting with things and then selecting passages and putting them together. It's a it's a, again, sort of an ecology of working, I suppose. You know, there is, there is one thing, but there's also another, and there could also be potentially very many different other things with it. So sometimes there is some text now sneaking in, sometimes there is spoken word now sneaking in. I'm not so scared of it anymore. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I like that, sort of different, the different approaches to it. Cool. Everyone looks hot. Um, there are a few bottles of water. Please help yourselves. And there's also uh, apple juice and oranges with um, croissants and her chocolate. <laughs> French Iron Town. That would be a bit, you know. So, if you want to maybe have a couple of minutes where people take some refreshments, is that okay? Yeah, time to get that. Yeah. 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 Guest. And I guess Shelley will be talking a little bit more of that feminist angle on the so yeah. Yeah. yeah, you did approach that already, so that will come to the technology itself. Voice and technology.
Shelly Nuts, please take your seat. Sort of like different forms of 
collaboration and how technology might um, play into that. So trying to put an umbrella over that, um, in general I would say my work is sort of about improvising with algorithmic systems and true algorithmic systems. Um, and often they've been systems that are sort of disruptive and annoying in various ways, um, which I have found useful as an improviser. Um, and um, I suppose I'm always interested as well in sort of having a critical slant on that, so not just like designing technology for technology's sake or um, uh, not like building the most fancy algorithm that does the most cool thing, but like thinking about this sort of like non-neutrality of technology. Um, and I really like this quote from Paul Magnuson where technology is never neutral, but does get its sort of meaning from the way it's utilized by a human actor. So what does it mean as a human to use that technology and how is it impacting the way that we're acting in a performance or interacting with other performers? Um, so um, I just want to talk a little bit more about um, live coding um, and how I sort of experienced um, live coding. Um, so uh, at this point I've done a lot of live coding performances, so more than 120. Um, and that's like spanned a lot of different genres. So I was like really interested in sort of like testing out live coding in different settings with different types of collaborators, making different kinds kinds of music with it, doing it in different contexts. Um, and so I feel like I've got quite a good view of like what the generalities were across those uh, sort of styles and contexts of um, doing live coding. Um, and so yeah, I've also done a lot of collaborations with other live coders and also people who are not live coding. Um, so sort of um, thinking about how live coding um, might be similar or different to different types of practices and how we might interact with them um, using that technology. Um, and one of the things that I like to talk about a lot um, <laughs> with live coding um, is this sort of like persistent experience of failure. So it's like very different um, in that way to other computer music practices, I think in that um, when you're writing your code on the fly, there's just like so many things that can go wrong in your performance. Um, and uh, so um, crashing in a performance is kind of like half of the course of live coding and something that happens a lot um, and it's sort of like become uh, like part of the culture of live coding essentially is um, uh, sort of experiencing on stage failure, as I did right there. Um, this was like a <coughs> gig where there was like 250 people there or something, so it was quite a big show and like my sound just like completely cut out like 20 minutes into a set when I was like just getting into it and my computer crashed and then I had to like restart and it was terrible. Um, but um, yeah, I think um, Um, it kind of made like the, the context uh, and the fact that there was other people who had like catastrophic crashes that night as well uh, made me think a bit more about this sort of like cultural aspect of failure in live coding. Um, and yeah, I mean there's a lot of things that can go wrong in live coding, so typographical errors, so you might just type something wrong and it causes your system to crash, like syntax errors. Um, not like remembering the piece of code to make something or like actually running out of computer memory is something that's happened to me on stage as well. Um, <coughs> you might have a like total system crash, you might just um, type a piece of code that you think is going to do one thing but actually does something entirely different, which might be a happy accident or it might be an unhappy accident depending on what comes out. Um, Aesthetic failure, I suppose it might just sound bad, but it's very common to all types of improv. Um, 
Yeah, in this so in this in this show, I kind of like felt bad about like the crash that had happened, but the gig organizer had said to me afterwards, she was just like, "Oh, that's fine. Crashing is just what happens in life coding," which is true. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, the the I think I was starting to think then more about what this means musically, and um, I really like this quote from Julian Moore Hoover. Uh, Alberto de Campo, who were one of the first like libraries for live coding, and they talk about um, the irreducible gap between what you might imagine when you're writing code and uh, what actually comes out, and how that sort of um, thread that moves the performance forward. Um, and um, yeah, I made a diagram because diagrams are cool. Um, so I was kind of thinking about um, this in terms of how um, you might always have, yeah, you always have sort of an imagined goal that you're working towards musically, um, and there's various ways that you might quite fail to reach that in life coding. Um, and ultimately, that's sort of like redirecting the course of the performance very often. Um, so I usually don't go into a life coding performance with a plan because it's not going to work out anyway. <laughs> um, so, um, but often these are like, you know, opportunities to do um, and I find that super interesting. Um, so, yeah, essentially, um, there's various people who have talked about this way of life coding as a way of like having to respond to unpredictable outputs of algorithmic systems, um, um, and um, I really like this quote from. Jeff Cox, um, where he talks about how code performs and is performed through the practice of coding in real time. Both mutually create and define each other, interacting in indeterminate and in certain ways. So, um, sort of talking, interesting that that to think about the interaction there between the performer and the code and how they're um, uh, mutually um, beneficial in various ways. Um, and I think. Uh, that's something, the way that, um, uh, I'm sort of struggling to formulate this point right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, th that you're never, you're never fully in control and that sort of implicates the human in the performance in like interesting ways. Um, and especially because it's like a very public failure that happens in live coding. So um, we always project our screen um, so this is a performer who's having a really bad time in a live coding performance and has a lot of errors going on. And when you're projecting your code and projecting your output, the audience can always see that. And so there's sort of like, you know, a bit of a like code drama that can go on in live coding performances um, where you don't really have a place to hide if everything goes wrong because there's like a screen behind you that says error on it. <laughs> um, um, and also the audience kind of knows when the error is starting and when it's ending as well. So um, yeah. Um, and uh, Francisca Schroeder talks about this in a really nice way. And she talks about um, sort of emphasizing the risk um, and deliberately exposing body and flux. So it's like a negotiation between the, um, uh, the, uh, the performer and the environment and the instrument and um, the uh, sort of level of controls between those systems are constantly um, uh, moving. Um, so live coding is not really a well-oiled machine, but we're needing to like constantly tweak and prod and interact with it. Um, so um, yeah, I kind of got interested in uh, sort of the ways in standard live coding systems um, the human is implicated, but then how we might sort of accentuate that. So I did some early experiments with like visualizing human action. So this is like a like visualization that just shows how I'm typing, like what I'm typing, the order I'm typing it in it, when I'm executing code and stuff like that. 
Um, and then I sort of had a peak Star Trek um, <laughs> moment uh, <laughs> when I decided to make a piece that was sort of specifically tackling like or looking at like how it feels to live code. Um, so I had a residency and there was someone there who was working with EEG and um, cognitive flow um, and so we decided like, to put an EEG monitor on me while I'm live coding. Um, um, which sort of like, you know, gave an interesting like visualization of like the peaks and troughs of like concentration and stress and stuff during a performance. Um, so I decided to maybe make that a bit more visible but also um, include that in the um, feedback loop of the performance. Um, so I made a piece um, where the, um, I think it was the concentration and the stress levels um, were changing um, how quickly I had to interact with code. So I had a lot of different windows with code in um, and it would change which one was on top at like various rates. So if like I was very stressed, it would change it faster, I think, just because I was feeling really self-punishing, I suppose, when I wrote the piece. Um, and it made it really difficult to interact, so I really had to, like, um, I suppose, like, um, have a different interaction with the system that I would normally have. Um, uh, I think I'll maybe skip through playing it, but essentially it had a bit of a visualization where I was showing, like, um, how I was typing, and also the code I was interacting with, and the, um, different uh, data values that I was getting out of the EG monitor. Um, yeah, um, I can't remember what time I started talking and how long I'm supposed to talk for. <laughs> you, I think you're good. So <coughs> you're good for 10-ish. 10 10-ish, 10 okay, cool. 15, 10 -ish. Maybe it's going to be more 15. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so um, that's a good segue, um, <laughs> because there wasn't a good link between the last slide and the next one. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, so through sort of these experiments um, with live coding and thinking about failure and then making some pieces that were like explicitly about body and live coding, I think I sort of like became a bit more aware of like how the technology is like implicating the body in performances. Um, and specifically, I started thinking about this as like a feminist issue as well. Um, so uh, this this nice XKCD comic where um, uh, I can't remember how it goes exactly, but it's like a man who's bad at maths. And they're like, oh, this guy is bad at maths, and then a woman who's bad at maths, and they're like, oh, all women are bad at maths. <laughs> and um, I think that's like interesting when you're performing with like an explicitly like technical. Um, medium like how audiences respond to that um, and around 2014 I was starting to feel like a bit more uncomfortable with um, live coding um, and sort of audience perception of this um, which was like probably like emphasized by the fact that like at the time I was like the only female live coder who was performing in the UK because some people had left and um, yeah and then it was just me um, so I was sort of like feeling like a bit of an anomaly on the scene and then also like having various like audience interactions which were like weird um, about, uh, I've got some quotes, um, uh, so getting like questions after from audience members like, <laughs> sorry? Fucking <laughs> hell. Yeah, yeah, so um, quotes from various men. Um, so, you know, um, you come off stage and get like these weird like questions like, so how did you get into programming? It's just like, well, how everyone else gets into programming? I don't know, it just happened. <laughs> and like, isn't it weird that you use Superliner? I suppose you think it is. Um, and um, it sort of made me think, I suppose, a bit about um, how being a female live coder was like breaking a lot of expectations. Um, so, uh, from Adam, one of Adam's papers. Uh, live coding um, is breaking expectations anyway because um, it neither fits into the sort of like embodied mode of 
performance um, that people associate with improvisation, nor um, the um, uh, sort of DJ mode of performance, which I suppose I was sort of in those spaces at the time doing our performances. Um, so people are like, you know, a bit curious about what this thing is anyway. Um, and then I also don't fit, fit into this sort of like stereotype of what a programmer looks like. Um, so, um, yeah, so live coding is breaking lots of expectations anyway. Um, and then um, uh, also sort of as this like quote from Emma Fox, who's an um, a electronic performer, also sort of like resonated with me that um, often your legitimacy if you exist in tech spaces is called into question, scrutinized more, um, uh, is thought of as a novelty, um, an anomaly, etc. Um, and so that's become sort of like essential experiences, like that it's weird that you do programming. <laughs> um, so I started, I think, thinking more about, um, I suppose, um, how I might integrate like feminist thinking into um, my work. Um, I like this quote from John Smith, Julie John Smith, who was uh, part of the feminist improvisation group, um, who were an uh, improvising group in the 60s and 70s, I think. Um, and she was talking about if you're already a spectacle, um, then uh, maybe a way to have agency is to <laughs> perform the spectacle more. Um, and um, yeah, um, I suppose it kind of became a bit of a political position. So um, I was thinking about how we might like reject whatever frame has been built and like work in different ways, resisting the technicality and think of it about more. Um, I mean, some of these things are I think, like ways that live coding is um, rejecting programmatic frameworks anyway. Um, but how could you like play those up even more? So um, I think I don't have that much time left, but I'm going to try and talk about a couple of projects that I've done in the last few years. Um, so uh, they're sort of like maybe the more explicitly like feminist work that I've been doing. Um, so um, yeah, let's just get on with that then. Um, uh, so uh, the one of the groups that um, Julian mentioned already it's awful. So this is like a female laptop ensemble, which is like ge like geographically distributed. So we have like performers in all parts of the world, and we send audio uh, streams to the performance space, um, um, and we perform together through the internet, um, and we always project our. Um, chat uh, as we're performing as a way to like give presence to the performers in the room um, and I built uh, I made like an algorithm to like mix the audio which is like trying to um, uh, use con like musical consensus as a way to and also equality as a way to mix audio streams um, so it tries to give like all of the performers like equal amounts of on air time um, whilst also making some sort of usable consensus. So streams that are most musically similar get mixed louder, but then if one person's playing a lot and someone else isn't, it kind of tries to um, uh, balance that by switching to playing the least similar streams. Um, so uh, I guess I was interested when I was writing this about like what a feminist um, al algorithmic music collaboration system might look like, and those seemed like good qualities to the forefront. Um, but one of the things that I found really interesting about this performance is the thing that people always comment on is the chat, um, which made me think about um, this sort of like um, uh, performing like technical problems essentially, because like a lot of the chat is like people talking about like, oh um, yeah, I can't hear the streams anymore, or like because it's all you know open source software that only half works and etc. Um, and um, and people like I think they really like the human connection, but I think it also like goes some way to like break down some technical barriers and saying well 
even if the technology doesn't work properly or um, we're struggling with those things, we're still making like a cool performance and um, everything doesn't have to work perfectly all the time. It's fine. Um, um, yeah. So um, didn't have a yeah didn't have a video about that. Um, and then um, another network music project I've been working on for the last year or so um, is called Contemporary Witchcraft uh, or Project Group. I don't know, we have two names, and I don't know why, but we do. Um, <laughs> uh, which is um, a performance I'm doing with two of my um, colleagues that I met in Australia. Um, one of them's a video artist and the other one um, works with movement. Um, and um, we, so it's a multimedia project, um, and we were sort of interested in playing with like narratives around programming and mysticism and like mediation. Um, and yeah, I think we, how we kind of got to that was I was kind of like interested in how um, sometimes people talk about technology in terms of like magic and like wizardry, and um, uh, yeah, it's always this like. Uh, male bias and always uh, sort of like obscures the fact that sometimes technology is very simple or like it's not about like being some sort of hero and um, uh, yeah and also it made me think about how like wizardry is usually a good thing but witchcraft is generally a bad thing um, so we started thinking about like uh, making a sort of like ritualistic um, uh, performance that thinks about witchcraft and uh, Sojo, one of my collaborators, is Korean and so she was interested in how witchcraft is portrayed in different um, uh, uh, cultures, so um, she, like Korean shamanism was um, also sort of like vilified. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, Yeah, and I also uh, like this quote about Ada Lovelace from Charles Babbage. Um, uh, Ada Lovelace was like the first programmer, um, and uh, he called her like an enchantress, and that she'd thrown her, her magical spell around the sciences, etc. Um, so, um, and then um, there was. Uh, also, as like programming shift shifted from being like primarily women to primarily men, um, some people talked about how it was shifted from shifting from being a more clerical work into like a black or black magic or a, or an art. Um, so it was interesting in these sort of like tensions in programming um, and how that might interact with like more embodied um, performance forms. Um, it kind of became a network project because I left Australia and um, yeah they're still in Australia <laughs> um, and um, that also sort of like made some interesting questions around mediation because I'm like the least performative embodied um, side of the group but I'm usually the person who's in the performance space now um, and so uh, I was sort of like interested in these sort of like layers of mediation, like my sound is always mediated by technology, but now like Kirby, who's like working with movement, is also mediated by the work. Um, and so we're sort of like weaving these threads of like bodies and mediation and processing. Um,
get put the wrong um, video clip in and took us something shorter. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's that's that one. And then, uh, like the most recent project I've worked on, um, is a solo piece, and um, uh, I. Um, yeah, I wanted to make something that was about sort of like the punk DIY aesthetic of live coding. So um, less about like virtuosic programming and more about like hacking. Um, so um, I made a piece that sort of referenced some of the 1990s from this punk music, from the Riot Girl music uh, movement. Um, so uh, essentially in the piece I'm like remixing Riot Girl um, with... Uh, machine listening, so I like analyze like a whole corpus of um, Riot Girl music, um, and in the performance, um, um, instead of programming audio, and uh, basically saying, well, give me like chunks of music that um, have this particular set of um, audio feature data um, values. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess I was kind of thinking about like Alvarez as sort of like algorithmic punk. Um, um, and yeah, it's kind of like a way of live coding that maybe prioritizes kind of hacking because I don't really know what kind of sound I'm going to get out of the code at all because I'm not making sound code. I'm just saying, okay, I'm putting in these values that give me something and then I'm playing with that sort of like rhythmically and texturally. Um, and yeah, I thought maybe this plays into like sort of anti-hierarchical um, ideals of like the uh, right girl movement. So um, it's like a really like non-judgmental way of listening. It's just like give me any audio with this sort of value, um, and then I'll respond to it. Um, still kind of thinking through whether it's like because they were like so like anti-technicality. -technic I'm like not sure whether it's like ethically okay to mediate Riot Girl in that way, but um, <laughs> it's kind of Um, yeah, questions? <laughs> 
Uh, <coughs> yeah, there's many questions, but I got one just specifically because I I followed you at, at the way you um, for a few years now and the way you got into all those things and then how you develop your work and I was thinking that's really interesting that you go for algo punk now uh, because I feel there is something get, now getting stuck somewhere with the live puddings. Uh, with the Algo Rave one side, so let's yeah. go for the techno scene and the uh, Algo Academism, yeah. which is kind of related to it. And and then also I was thinking recently about the fact that we were using Super Collider in the early 2000s in the uh, what we co used to call the glitch music, so people like Pita or all these uh, Karkowski, all those guys. And um, and I was thinking that's part of the history that is kind of not really uh, attached to this. And they were much more punks uh, at that time, and they didn't show the the live coding. Yeah. Uh, and it was hidden. So, uh, but they had similar issues like the failures and all the things, and probably there were not very much female there. That's another question. But that was early back early two thousand. But I was thinking, how um, is that what I'm saying about all this different movement in the uh, live coding? Is is that why make you react and start to to think about yeah, we need to go somewhere else because we're getting stuck here with the with this and how you approach that uh, yeah how is it referring to this other algorithm algo mechanisms and yeah yeah no I think it's like like it's an interesting time for live coding because um, yeah I've been sort of in the scene um, since 2012 um, and I feel like in 2012 there was a lot more experimental live coding and like um, maybe thinking about different ways of doing it and now sort of algorithm has been become like a really big thing and it's like you know it's a double-edged sword that it's really good because it puts like live coding into like the public realm and we're getting like a lot of people who become interested in it through sort of like the visibility of Algorave, um, but it also in some ways puts like a like limiting factor on the music because it puts it in this like beat based, um, uh, or this like culture of beat based music. Um, and yeah, I think, <coughs> Also, a lot of the maybe like a lot of the tech development in live coding recently has also been more towards um, making beat based music or like how to make algorithm like more efficiently um, with different types of code. Um, so, I think, yeah, I'm just more interested in, I suppose, the experimental side and because I came through from making noise music and pretty much learned how to make algorithm on the job <laughs> more or less um so yeah yeah sort of highlighting that side more um yeah i mean my my now defunct um band um algo babes babes we were like i guess um like yeah this was alex like the first time we performed um saying that we <laughs> broke algorithm because we um were making like super noisy um beat based music um in sort of contexts where there was like a lot more sort of like electronica i suppose um so i'm sort of interested in like pushing that envelope I didn't 
talk about today, but like the more network music system type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to make systems that make it more difficult for the performer or like mess up your like musical flow in like various ways. And so I'm kind of interested in like how that interaction might like make a mm -hmm. fundamentally different performance or um, would get you out of like sort of like the the flow and more in like a reflecting um, form of listening I suppose. So I suppose in, in sort of in normal life digital tools are there for perfecting things, yeah, yeah making that sound easier so that sort of turns that around which are quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and I think like I, I experimented with like a lot of different ways of um, improvising with laptops, and I think um, for me, like when I started live coding, I just it just felt a lot more like inherently risky and instrumental um, and closer to. Um, yeah, I was working with like jazz musicians at one point, and um, I felt with like pre-coded patches, I couldn't really like interact with them in the way that. I to, um, and it was like just way more safe <laughs> than I wanted like a performance to be. So I think like in your life, I think like we really cut that amount of like risk back into performance. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to connect to Tunisia, this one. Right. Yeah. <coughs> so we could have a little pause the times I connect with Swad in Tunisia and then we'll uh, Salut Swat. Is he working? Hello Julien. Hello Swat. Salut. Comment ça? People have uh, a little pause now. He's on a petite pause. If we, uh, after that, it's your turn, will be, ça sera ton tour après. J'ai mis la vidéo, I put the video on. I mean, it's not running, ça, ça marche pas, mais je la déclenche au moment où tu peux parler. Après, pour les questions, je te mettrai euh, sur l'écran, d'accord I will put you uh, on the screen for the questions. Et je te, je te traduirai. I will translate. Is everyone could hear Ah, ouais. Je peux faire juste un petit essai de voix. You do a little uh, test voice for the volume. Speak louder on the microphone, or you can speak louder on the microphone. Yes, 
que tu m'entends là Tu m'entends Sans ce bâton Ouais. C'est mieux là. Excusez-moi. Ça se bâton. Euh, tu m'entends bien Yes. Oui. Ouais. Donc moi j'ai retiré la vidéo direct. Donc là je. En fait en plus elle coupe donc je peux pas. Je peux voir en, en parallèle. Je peux pas voir en parallèle. Ok. She's not going to be able to see herself live stream. That's what she's saying. Mm. <coughs> okay. Okay, maybe we will start. On démarre, tu me dis quand démarrer la vidéo. D'accord, dans... Là, tu peux... Euh, si tu veux, quand je commence à dire uh, in my uh, artistic approach. Yes, you tell me when to start. Yes, thank you. Je commence. Okay. okay. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you Julien for this invitation. I'm uh, happy uh, to call from Tunisia. It's my first uh, talk uh, in English. Uh, I introduce myself uh, quickly. I am a visual artist. I use video, photography, uh, metadata, performance, and my work uh, is uh, conceptual. Uh, in the context of uh, this conference, where it's about uh, electronics and abstraction, therefore, uh, inevitably, information and thoughts, I propose a self poetic uh, reading that I entitled uh, Impressions for Another Run and how to become one with the world. I will show you two recurring regimes in my artistic and experimental work that establish connection between the here and the elsewhere, the body and the machine, the sensitive and the abstract, and the subjective and the collective. First, I will show you my work related to the earth, three, through a series of performances entitled Anchors Points that engage my physical presence on different terrestrial territories. I will show you in parallel an archive which represents a data visualization of a genealogy of a human presence in full uh, metaphysics that I entitled Embedded Impressions. I will therefore make a back and forth reading between the two videos and I will talk about the possibility of being part of the world through a mobile artistic uh, practice. In my artistic approach, I saw in the universe under the mode of sharing and coordination, the image of my self-portrait in search of a possible encounter with the given, from Paris to London, via Gapsa or not, I probe links, leave traces, I archive them and I connect them to others by creating networks that participate in the branching, densification, and settlement of my world, both human and digital. And eventually, on the processual project that I, I titled Elmen, She Loves Me. Through this projection, we watch two videos as the obverse and the reverse of the same field of reflection around the territories, one territorial and the other digital. The first is a performance and an intervention land art. After the desert of Gapsa, this performance was carried out in another climate and geographical context on the majority island in Italy as part of the open army. Following the same protocol in different countries, I isolate myself from the urban life in a place very little frequented and I let myself observe it only by some witnesses. The second video is a data visualization which represents charters in the form of scattered, intermingled, and multicolored static and moving points. It represents the temperature of the digital from us or we recorded meteor meteorological information. We, because uh, this generative platform undergoing metamorphosis in achieved uh, thanks to the combination of um, several intelligence that I will call geo-intelligence. 
This visual of points in motion is currently being co-directed and researched with the collective effort of Dipli. Each city is a ramified line of escape, and in every city represented there is an infinity of stories with the potential, uh, potential forms. On the model of the Taz, theorized by Hakim Bey, the anchor points are imaginated as a clandestine occupation of a zone, an operation that frees and isolates a place and transforms, transforms it into space of temporary artistic intervention far from the code imposed by artistic structure and politicism. On the same model, this intervention land art relocates progressively and naturally under the effect of the climb carried by wind or rain and voluntarily via electronic interfaces that gives them shape elsewhere, mainly in virtual and digital spaces and in multiple times. The anchor points and a nomadic way of life, Gafsa and the Majori Island, find their origin in my first action that of dissemination of web. Uh, on the web of my self-portrait in 2010, an approach that has created links with others and anchored in its territory via geographical and digital indication. The self-portrait then becomes relationships and cartography with geolocated and archived landmarks. So I continue to move in time to transform myself and even my self-portrait and the project element, continue to transform themselves by becoming a core of varied relationships. However, the self-representation through relational and remote mobility movement becomes an abstract figure in the form of a red dot on a territory already visible. A point that I consider a living energy or a molecular and an invisible database in which there is a general sorry is a gen genealogical information of the project. Information that has the potential of data stories. So I distanced myself from this figure 